Good morning and welcome to another installment of the Advisor Insight Series brought to you by the Advisory Board Centre. Uh, my name is Brendan Logue and I'm the Director of Talent for the Advisory Board Centre. Um, Honoured to bring you a, a panel discussion with three leaders of the highest order. Um, the focal point for today's conversation is, of course, the emergence of a recent requirement for aged care providers in Australia to establish and maintain a quality care advisory board uh, and offer a consumer advisory body uh, to, to members of their communities. Um, my plan for our time uh, together today includes some, some background uh, for which I'll try and be brief as my commitment to you is to ensure that uh, you get a good portion of Q&A uh, at the back end of our time together. I suspect that um, many of you who joined today's conversation are wondering who the Advisory Board Centre is, um, so I'll try and address that question now. Um, in essence, we are a proudly founder-led business. We're five years into a 100-year journey to democratise access to a way of thinking that helped Louise, our founder, get out of her own way and scale a business beyond her wildest dreams. Um, the Advisory Board Centre is the professional body for the advisory sector globally, and we exist to support the growth and maturation of a segment of the market that sits neatly between management consulting and governance boards. Um, as I see it, uh, we believe that there are alternatives to the McKinsey way. Um, like many other professional bodies, our key business model has, has two key revenue streams, that is membership and education, of whom uh, typically those who are independent professionals or those who are part of uh, a, an enterprise who, who are now required to have advisory boards. Um, our activities, if I just touch on these elements, um, include research, education, professional development, and advocacy, uh, which is part of what brings us together today. Um, our progress um, is highlighted by some of the statistics at the bottom of that slide that's available to you now. Uh, key ones today, which we will spend some time on, perhaps towards uh, just before the Q&A, will relate to, I guess, the number of organisations who we have helped uh, with the establishment of their advisory boards and um, and the other one, the, the number of people who are part of this very geographically and, and um, industry-wise uh, diverse community. <clears throat> um, I mentioned we've, earlier that we've been around for just over five years. Prior to this, advisory boards were a little like the Wild West. The structure, if there was one, tended to be relatively informal and all too often plagued by conflicts of interest. Um, a lack of measurement or clarity of purpose also meant that chemistry was the basis for many of these engagements and who got a seat and the results were all, all too often, a, I guess, a circular talk fest, which I'm sure we've all observed. Um, all of this, uh, it should be recognised as somewhat understandable when you consider the lack of historical regulation in the sector. Um, to close the loop, uh, our focus in terms of the Advisory Board Centre and those who choose to get involved with us is to change that. Uh, our, our, our essence is to support the growth of the sector by ensuring that those involved have access to a set of tools and frameworks that ensure their engagements are ethical and measurable and ultimately, in particular for this segment of the market, maximally impactful. Um, before I, I stop talking and, and uh, hand over to my, my esteemed guests, I wanted to clarify what an advisory board is and how it is different to, I guess, a governance board. Um, and, and so, put most simply, governance boards have responsibility, many responsibilities, one of which includes the hiring and firing of CEO. An advisory board or an advisory body, in the case of the regulation handed down by the Australian government, is there to support the CEO or the governance board to make better informed decisions. Um, and so I think that distinction is worth knowing up front and, and perhaps um, reflecting on as we mature this conversation today. Um, 
So with the context somewhat out of the way, um, I, I've sort of covered off on, on what I hope to share um, as far as the advisory board centre is concerned. What I'm keen to do next is introduce members of um, our panel and then get into the context of the aged care industry as it relates to uh, Australia in particular. Um, so uh, we spoke about the, the uh, CEOs uh, and board members. Um, thrilled to introduce Toby Hall. Uh, Toby is a certified chair, uh, member of the advisory board centre. He's now an independent portfolio professional um, and he spent many years as a group CEO, company director in both hospitals and health services, as well as the ACE care industry. Toby, we're, we're thrilled to have you join us for the call and looking forward to your insights. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, next on the line, Lynn Bailey. Um, Lynn is currently the director of uh, senior communities for Fresh Hope Care, uh, which is an aged care operator with many sites down in New South Wales. Um, Lynn is a member of the National Organisational Committee for ACPA, uh, who you'll, you'll all know is um, a newly consolidated peak body. Um, uh, she's also uh, a member of the ACHSM, uh, as well as a registered nurse, um, also a, a certified chair and very much a, a, a strong contributor to, to the Advisory Board Centre. Uh, hello, Lynn. Good to see you again. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brendan. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, lastly, um, Kevin Andrews, uh, for those of us lucky enough to be based in Australia, um, Kevin will no doubt be recognisable um, uh, as, a, as a broadcaster. He made a very good politician. Uh, Kevin, of course, served as a Member of Parliament for, for over 30 years. He was uh, Minister for Ageing uh, early on in, in his ministerial career, later appointed to Cabinet uh, as the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations uh, during a consequential time. Um, and later was responsible for um, social services, which of course includes aged care and disability services. Uh, Kevin as well is a certified chair and member of the advisory board center. Um, he's also a director uh, in many boards, including uh, Villa Maria Catholic Homes. Um, Kevin, thank you for making the time uh, uh, for this conversation. You're just on mute there, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Brendan, and a great pleasure to be with everyone. Likewise. Um, so I, I, I wanted to just provide a bit of a preamble, as, at least as it relates from my perspective into the industry context. Um, as we know, back in, back in August, the Australian government passed the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment. The bill implements nine key measures, all, in, all aimed at improving the aged care sector, and, and, you know, in, in response to the 17 recommendations of the Royal Commission itself. Um, Kevin, given your unique viewpoint, I hope to start with you uh, for the, my first question. Um, obviously, given your time with uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the responsibility for this portfolio, um, how would you describe the, the challenges and opportunities that the sector is facing today? Um, thanks, Brendan. Can I, at the outset, um, recognise the many challenges that the aged care sector um, is facing? Um, there is the, the, the ongoing regulatory burden. There is the challenge in terms of staffing aged care uh, homes and services, which is, is ongoing. Uh, and then there's a myriad of other challenges as well. So I don't think any of us on this panel in any way underestimate um, the real challenges which the aged care sector is facing at the present time. And those of you who are listening who are involved in it in a day-to-day -day basis will know that so very well. Of course, these changes and in particular, the advisory committees arise from the report of the Royal Commission. I see them as an opportunity because putting in place good advisory boards, whether it's in the aged care sector or more broadly in any other sector is actually a way of being ahead of the game in ensuring quality assurance for an organisation. And this, these requirements, which no doubt we can go into in some more detail if there's questions about it, but in a sense, they provide 
a minimal requirement in terms of a six month report. But I think that should be in a sense, the threshold or the basis upon which more can be done. If good data can be provided, if good feedback can be provided to aged care providers on a regular basis, uh, then that puts them in a better situation than they would be other than simply uh, ticking the boxes in the regulatory system which exists at the present time. So yes, recognise the challenges, but B, see this as a great opportunity to be able to move forward. Yeah, great point. And, and appreciate your comments there, Kevin. Toby, I'd love to get your perspective, uh, perhaps one, you know, fresh out of the CEO's uh, and board members' seats. Um, how do you see uh, that key element that relates to the, I guess, the challenges, but more in terms of the opportunities that that Kevin has has touched on? Yeah, personally, I absolutely see this as an opportunity. In, in the health sector, we worked with community advisory boards for a long period of time. Um, consumer feedback is very common. I, I frankly think in the quality and safety field, um, both in the health sector and in aged care, it's, it's now such a complex uh, area requiring really specialist knowledge. It's very hard for boards as a whole to get their head around um, and understand all of that. So having advisory boards, I actually think it's a really beneficial thing for boards. Um, on the quality and safety area, it provides them a protection that allows them to bring in experts who understand the space incredibly clearly. And on the consumer side, I think uh, every board should want to know what their consumers think. They should want valid feedback. And quite often in both cases, those committees are able to feedback to the board's information that quite often management may not be quite as good at passing on as they should be. Whereas a frank and fearless um, advisory committee can give very good advice to boards to actually really uh, tell them there's any problems and let them to let, let the board focus on those and get them fixed before they become a really big issue. Thank you, Toby. And Lynn, you've also worked in, in an acute setting within the hospital environment, but more recently spent 10 years in leadership roles in the aged care sector. Um, how how do you see, um, as an extension to that same theme, I guess the opportunities and, and the state of the organisation's readiness to seek out a perspective then beyond their four walls, if you like? I think picking up um, particularly on Toby's um, statement about the opportunities, if I just focus on uh, the clinical component, um, it's an opportunity for everybody. Um, I know we're talking aged care today, but could equally be any area of um, the healthcare system is very much about reimagining our clinical governance committees and having had uh, the pleasure of spending um, many, many hours in clinical governance committee meetings. One of the things that particularly of value using the advisory board centres framework is it's very focused on outcomes. It's very connected to improving patient care and resident care. And without the, that best practice structure, it's very easy for clinical governance committees to get caught up in pages and pages, tens of pages, sometimes hundreds of pages of reporting, but without actually being able to pull out for the governance board what specific things are flagging and what specifically are some of the options for the governance board to consider in relation to addressing that. So I think that discipline of having three things that you're working on at any point in time and being held to account on delivering by the business, I think is advantageous. And getting the opportunity for more of our consumers and customers to get feedback directly through to the governance board, I think is, is, is fantastic. And whilst we've had some of those in aged care in the past, and certainly in retirement living, we have residence committees. We sometimes see a number of committees on um, the residential aged care and also in home care, but not with the direct line to the board that this particular format and process allows. So I agree it's an absolutely an opportunity. And just in relation to the six monthly meetings, uh, we, we meet every four weeks um, and we'll probably continue to do that. We'll go to, sorry, we'll go to eight weekly over the Christmas new period as most of our uh, would do, but we've got so much work to do in the sector and it's too important for us to be, even if we report only six monthly, which is a requirement at the moment under the subordinate legislation, um, still that monthly get together is critical from our perspective. 
So then what you've alluded to there is going, I suppose, beyond compliance, which mm. is, um, uh, I suppose, somewhat of a, a nice lead into the, the next um, area that I, I wanted to look carefully at. And, and given, uh, I think you raised earlier, the 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 burden and the, the, the challenge that the industry sector has faced over the last two years are right? unprecedented um, mm -hmm. and and given the challenges around people and other elements with an overlay of a Royal Commission findings as, as grave as they were, um, you know, it, it is, there is the, the need to look at, well, what's the path out? So um, uh, from, from your perspective, Kevin, um, do you feel that the Act... Uh, is a step towards achieving its intended purpose, which is sort of highlighted there in that in that blue box around providing, uh, I guess, a positive impact to the safe and uh, uh, safety and quality of of residents. Yes, I, I do, Brendan. Um, ha having um, served on a board uh, of a body outside aged care uh, and chairing a quality assurance committee in in a different field. This, in a sense, is bringing aged care into the same realm that many other uh, corporate entities operate in now. Mm -hmm. And I think this is positive because as the chair of a quality assurance committee, uh, this is the sort of information I want to know. Lynn made reference to the subordinate uh, legislation of which there's a draft out. It provides a comprehensive framework mm -hmm. and it provides eight items on which the six monthly report to the governing body um, should cover things including feedback by care recipients and staff, any co complaints received, concerns that the Quality Care Advisory Board has, uh, regulatory action taken, progress in relation to plans for continuous improvement, uh, performance reports, staffing arrangements, uh, et cetera. So this is a comprehensive framework and for an aged care provider, this is the sort of information if I was on the governing board that I would I would want to know. And to have that feedback on a regular basis, I think is very important, which is why I said, I think if this is well done, then it gives the opportunity to actually be ahead of the game rather than playing catch up because um, some incidents occurred or some complaint has been made. Uh, this, if done on a regular basis, as Lynn was talking about, I think puts the aged care provider in a position of having much more information upon which to be able to act in a timely manner. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you, Kevin. Um, Toby, when we last caught up, you mentioned that further regulation such as this only follows following, uh, I guess, a failure of industry or the market. Um, uh, how are you seeing your peers in industry responding to the possibility of taking some of those more risky conversations away from the governance table and instead having a more challenging, um, uh, let's think about how we might style conversation uh, uh, elsewhere. I, I think there's obviously mixed views. I mean, the, you, you have this continuous stream of, uh, of people saying, oh, it's too much regulation, it's too complex and we can't get our heads around it. But regulation tends to only be inactive when people have not been doing what they should have been doing in the first place. And, and the fact is, it's quite clearly that well-run aged care organisations should never have been in the position that uh, many of them got into. And that's a failure of the organisations and it's a failure of governance. And in an environment where the organisation is well-run, they would never have got into the position we got into. And then, then what tends to happen is government says, well, how do I fix this? And, and often maybe some people view that government goes too far in their attempts and efforts to fix things. But, but the reality is we're talking about the most precious people in our society, often who can't look after themselves, often suffering from dementia. We're talking about people's mums and dads, and they absolutely deserve um, the level of care that I think the government is aspiring to. And I can categorically tell you my experience in health is that when there's been a problem within the healthcare sector, there is always someone who knew about it well before it became public, well before it's publicised, uh, and often well before the board as the organisation heard about it. And where there was a gap was actually the ability to have uh, committees like this actually look really closely and independently from the board and actually give advice on it. And certainly my experience at um, St Vincent's was that was the case a couple of times where 
we had significant clinical issues that people knew uh, and we put a lot of time and effort into saying how do we create an environment where there's an opportunity for issues to be raised and dealt with by the management and board internally rather than it, it just becoming a surprise to everyone so whilst there's a level of cynicism i can understand people don't like regulation we, we bought this largely on ourselves and my, my view stepping aside from that is that this is absolutely best practice in terms of the quality advisory side of things and consumer advisory side of things any good organization should have this in place and so i wouldn't see this as a burden in fact if anything it creates a safety valve for the ceo and a safety valve for the board to say we've got people looking at these really important issues for us hopefully um giving us advice and recommendations on how to respond to them and that, that's got to be a good thing and mm. and the reality is where people don't want to have that kind of thing in place you've got to turn around and say Maybe it's time to wake up and smell the tea leaves because the world has changed. Toby, you've touched on a, a, an element of, I guess, culture there, which is which is one that um, no industry or organisations finds easy to shift the needle on. How was it that, if you were successful, St Vincent's was able to move the needle and ensure that you know, levels or bureaucracy don't get in the way of outcomes, positive outcomes for customers? Uh, we, we absolutely put in place uh, a system to allow much better customer and patient feedback, um, which was provided transparently and was available to anyone in the organisation and to customers to see. Uh, we also implemented an internal system, which again came through the quality advisory uh, committee structure that allowed any people who had issues in terms of clinical governance to raise them anonymously if they wanted to and to raise them in a way that they would be looked at. Uh, and it, interesting, interesting enough, when we introduced that, there's a lot of people who criticised and said that would never work, but actually found it quite, to be quite phenomenal. And I, I, I can't remember one time where anyone misused that anonymity, but what I can remember is a number of times where people raised really important issues that we're able to address really early on at root cause. And that's what's the benefit of this type of committee is if you get the reporting structure right, if you take it and value it, you can get feedback from customers and clinical feedback and act on it. And that's why I think this legislation has got some uh, some real merit and strength to it. And we should try and embrace it. And the, and the fact is, those who don't embrace it are just going to have problems again with the regulator. So it is time to get on board and see this is part of the future. Mm -hmm. Get on board. Okay, understood. Thank you, Toby. Uh, Lynn, you strike me as someone who's well and truly on board. Um, you, you chose to, uh, with the endorsement of your, your board and CEO, to go ahead uh, with an advisory board and soon to be two advisory boards, despite the latter not being necessarily mandatory, um, and have agreed uh, for us to follow you on that path and, and support us in our learning of the sector. Um, how has that journey through executing uh, the theory that you would have learnt via the Advisory Board Centre, how has that process been for you and your, your executive and clinical leaders at Fresh Hope Care? It's been going really well, Brendan, and... We uh, did come into this earlier than what we needed to, so that um, we have the opportunity to, well, we accepted this was going to be a learning journey for us all. Um, whilst and some of our executive team had been advised, uh, exposed to advisory bodies or advisory boards previously or committees, they'd not worked with this, the structure that we use from the advisory board centre. So we had um, been going through a period of learning. Our executives have under, uh, undertaken the fundamental uh, fundamentals course through the advisory board centre. And that's really helped me as the chair because people coming in with an understanding of the language, an understanding of the process, and really understanding that the tools and the structure that we use is critical to abide by to be able to deliver on the best practice framework. So that, that has been terrific from our perspective. On our clinical um, advisory body, 
we, which we used to call the advisory board. We've changed to the advisory body because there's a little bit of confusion uh, in the sector when we use board for two different things. So we're keeping board for governance only, and we uh, are using advisory body um, for um, our advisory teams. So one of the things that was really important in relation to that is adhering to the structure that the advisory board centre puts forward in our training, because missing a single step is problematic. And the spending the time to actually do the scenario mapping, who's going to be participating, what are the reporting lines going to be like, what is the relationship between the advisory body and the governance board, all critical pieces of conversation to have. And the other thing was landing on what are the first three things uh, that you're going to deal with and having the opportunity for people to understand the business. We've got two external advisors on our clinical advisory body. Um, one is a lawyer who specialises in aged care and the other one is a geriatrician. Um, so it's really helpful for them to get the insights into the organisation that we can give them through this process to help to help us ensure that we're focused on the most critical things for improving consumer experience and uh, our resident care. So it's been a great process. Everybody's really enjoyed it. Um, and we've had a number, we've, we're loaded with very senior staff at the moment um, from the point of view of our advisory body because everybody wants an opportunity to play. So we've got our chief risk officer, we've got our CEO, um, we've got all our senior clinicians, we've got an OT, we've got a nurse consultant. So we've got a variety of people and um, meeting every four weeks and everybody's really enjoying it. We're all learning lots from each other. And there's a couple of people that uh, are currently working in that advisory body who are going on to do further studies, which the advisory board seen. So I think that's fantastic. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, and look forward to reconnecting when it comes around to the consumer advisory bodies uh, push as well um, as things mature and roll out. Uh, have you got yes. an essence of what that might look like uh, for Fresh Hope Care at least? Um, yes, certainly, Brendan. So we will kick that off the first quarter of next year. We wanted to do the clinical first because we believe that was the most pressing at the time from a governance board perspective. But also this was a learning journey, as I said, and we needed to, to make sure we had been through the process, were comfortable with the process and understood how to use it well before we invited consumers. And so we will have the consumer advisory body um, uh, stand up in the first quarter of next year. We've got three streams of aged care in our business. We do retirement living, uh, we do social support and we do residential aged care. And we will have representatives from each of those areas on our committee. And um, we will also be putting out um, through the advisory board center uh, and expressions of interest for someone who is a consumer experience specialist. So an SME in that area, because we don't have it internally. And we recognize one of the big, the, the biggest experience for me, uh, learning experience with the advisory board center was having the opportunity to be um, on the aged care advisory board project. Um, and being able to see play out that the advantage of having people from a variety of different backgrounds and the richness of the conversation and learning that takes place. Um, so that's why we're taking that approach and a big supporter of uh, having external people um, come into your advisory boards or bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, Lynn, that's... Um... You haven't seen my slides, but um, no, it's haven't. like you had. So there you go. Uh, the, the reference to the the Aged Care Advisory Board, unsurprisingly, as the Advisory Board Centre, uh, we believe that the structure has a lot of merit. And, and when it came to recognising that we wanted to contribute to the growth and maturation of the sector, which we've discussed the context of it, um, we recognised that there was a limit to what we knew and that we needed to get some context in from those leaders who also shared the desire to make a positive impact. And so we really appreciate yours and Toby's as well as other members of the advisory board whose names are highlighted on that slide uh, because it meant that we could stick to our knitting in terms of what does best practice look like regardless of industry segment and get the overlay of the, the context and the, you know, even down to terminology and terms of reference 
uh, practicality of tool, tools and frameworks to get them tailored to the needs of the sector was really beneficial. And 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 thank you, uh, Toby and Lynn, for for contributing to that. I know I was um, mostly the note taker in those conversations, but it was very enjoyable to to hear the passion that you have for the sector and and the the joy in your voices contributing to something new uh, was mm. was was palpable. So. Um, the the uh, I guess the nuance around sticking to your knitting, but also recognizing that there was an opportunity there was was what I wanted to recognize. Um, um, next up, uh, I think it, it you know we we've sort of touched on elements of uh, what does good look like and um, getting whether that's clinical governance or whether that's the the getting your structure right for the organization. It's perhaps no different to when you're you're embarking on taking up a new structure, even if it's one that the the uh, regulator has been uh, so good as to explain how it might work. Um, uh, the I was interested, Lynn, if I may uh, pick on you further for a moment. How you have found the advisory board structure to be different from the subcommittee that would have been typical in that uh, clinical excellence space, if you like. I think very much, Toby, it is about that, um, that structure and the tools and framework and just the discipline um, that it requires uh, to be able to, to work through all the areas that you need to address and to be very clear that everybody that's on your advisory board or advisory body has bought in um, to the structure, to the best practice framework and understands the importance of the advice um, that they're giving to the governance board to be able to do that. So I think it's very much that structure piece in healthcare, doesn't matter which area of health we happen to be working in at the time, um, best practice is where we need to be. And um, this is a great, albeit um, enforced by the legislator, um, it's uh, a great thing for the aged care sector to be exposed to. Um, and I think my only disappointment in relation to, to what's come out so far is that uh, the consumer advisory body is being, um, being offered a requirement to offer it to your consumers uh, once every 12 months in writing. We are not offering, we're just doing. Um, it's because their voice is far too important. I hear you. Yeah. Uh, Toby, anything else you'd like to add to that same, uh, I guess, theme? Yeah, look, I think the way the, the tools are today for consumer advisory feedback, it's very easy to get uh, feedback from, um, from from your community and whether it's in retirement living or aged care. We certainly, uh, it's meant since in the current aged care I'm working on, we'll, we'll be doing that on a weekly basis, really. And the, the reason why is you want to understand exactly where your customers are feeling at any point in time. Every business wants to be able to do that. And in this case, I, and space, I think it's um, it's even more important. So, yeah, I, th I, um, I, I think having the discipline in there is important. I, and I think one of the things maybe for, for people on the call to take on board is the need to ensure which is absolutely best practice from an advisory board point of view exactly what's going to be structured and put in place right up front to make sure these um, processes are delivered properly and the first step of doing anything on the advisory board is to have a really clear scope and I think anyone who does a clear scope is going to be asking the sort of questions that Lynn raised and making sure that, that information is there it's available on a regular basis and, and to be honest anyone who does that consumer feedback on an annual basis it's, uh, it's crazy and, and when you put it into simple terms uh, I know this is kind of getting a little bit tough but it's the reality of aged care uh, most people are with us for 18 months and so you're saying you're going to get information from some people two thirds of the way through their journey with you to find out how they feel. And no, no one would think that's a sensible thing to do. And so we have to be far more proactive than that, I think. Mm. Kevin, uh, if I might pull you in on this, you've been exposed to some pretty robust systems of governance in your time. Um, why is it that you chose to come and get involved with and, and lead advisory boards uh, at this stage? Uh, I suppose I've seen aged care from a different perspective, namely from the, from the legislative perspective about what we're trying to do nationally to respond to 
um, all the interest and to care as best we can. For me, this is an opportunity to go back to, in a, in a sense, um, you know, the basic roots of aged care itself and to be able to make a contribution with the experience I've had from the legislative point of view. But more importantly than that, as I think both Toby and Lynn have pointed out, th this is a structure which is a good one in place. It is best practice. Um, if you were sitting down and designing a system in which you would uh, try and put best practice in place, then you would come up with something like this in any event. And the fact that it's there, that it can be picked up easily or readily easily uh, by aged care providers. And the fact that it's been in a sense imposed by government or by the parliament through legislation, um, I think really can be put aside because if you were doing this from the perspective of wanting the best practice for an aged care home or an aged care provider, this is the sort of thing you would put in place. Yeah, no, I appreciate that commentary. Thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, I, I wanted to to get on to the, the probably the nagging question uh, for many, many who are attending the call as, as our guests in terms of the so what question. Um, I think it's it's necessary that I, I explain why I've broken the cardinal sin as far as a, a presentation uh, slide is concerned. It, the grey of this slide explains what the advisory board center does as it relates to education and best practice the blue is for those uh, industry proponents who might want to outsource the leadership and establishment of their advisory board so we recognize that perhaps uh, there will be those industry operators who are um uh, yeah, just looking to keep the lights on and that that's okay, that there is support available. Um, so uh, before I, I guess I open up the q and I wanted to explain the, the, the fact that uh, the advisory board centre has got your back on either side of the equation. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on and, and it relates to the why the tools and frameworks actually work is because they've been developed and refined over time by practitioners. And I think it's that that uh, grassroots up approach rather than a theoretical framework down approach, which provides a comparison for why leaders enjoy uh, the insights that they get from adopting advisory boards uh, versus, uh, I, I guess, other structures and or insight mechanisms that are that are available within the the ideas marketplace if you like um so that's probably um enough i would say uh in terms of the slideshow uh and the structured component of our conversation so i might uh just stop sharing for a moment and um get to some questions um so uh i've got a question here from Michelle, um, uh, how do you see this work for standalone facilities who have limited staff with knowledge uh, and many areas of challenges? Um, identifying the right advisory board now is more complicated when you're a regional town with less than two and a half thousand people. So in essence, yeah, uh, uh, those who understand the context, um, uh, may not be within the backyard and also where limited resources are a real consideration. Um, maybe Lynn, uh, that, that question's best aimed at you. Uh, would you mind helping um, Michelle out with an understanding of, of uh, the advisor concierge service that you, you briefly touched on earlier? Sure. Um, Michelle, I um, did my nursing training in a regional area, so totally get scarce resources and um, a very limited pool to draw from. And one of the things that I think is important um, and being helped by the pandemic itself is or we can work virtually all over the world now um, and quite comfortably and people are more comfortable with that than they may have been um, before the pandemic and with the advisory concierge um, offering through the advisory board centre it doesn't cost anything to put up an expression of interest to say that you're after 
either a specialist advisor or you're after an advisory board chair and to say what sort of background you want them to have. So there's certainly some organisations that prefer their advisors or their chairs to be there in person, but many don't. Um, and it's one of the reasons why, why the advisory board centre can actually run a global organisation with advisors all around the world. And certainly for us and for me, um, the our ability to tap into um, the European providers who went through the worst of COVID way before it came to our shores uh, really helped shape what we did and their um, openness in sharing their learnings with us made a huge difference to how we managed during the pandemic. So um, the advisory board concierge can certainly help you and you can have people from all around the world. Uh, that's your choice. So the advisory board doesn't select them for you, but they will um, collect the expressions of interest and the decision certainly remains with the business about who, if any of those people that have put forward an expression of interest um, are su most suitable for you, because that's an important consideration as well, Michelle. I think that's a really key point, Len. Is that there, there's a saying that get around that gets around the advisory board community um, that you have to meet people where they are, and I think that really resonates when you consider the additional complexities of a small rural town, Absolutely. limited resources. Um, the McKinsey Way doesn't exist in that part mm. of the world. So where do you get perspective of those who? get you and understand you um, is is a key question. And, and I, I think the key element as far as the advisor concierge that I would add from what you've already explained is the emphasis that we are wanting to provide a channel to some people who do this as, as, as part of what they do for a living, if you like. And so they are, we, we select less than 10% of people to be part of our community, which means they're quality people. They understand the need to meet people where they are. So A, good people who get it. And B, um, they've been involved with and trained and are, are, are subscribed to the notion of the need for professional development, given this is a, it's a vocational style of learning. You need to learn from others who are further along a particular road and pick what works for you uh, because the, the power of, the conversation is is the critical element so um as far as selection is concerned it is the organization's decision to make you're not getting center resource to utilize it's around who best fits your needs and that may well change over time ideally as the organization um you know uh, finds their feet and becomes uh takes up a more uh, confident pose i would say um uh, Kevin, anything else to add uh, over and above that key question as it relates to the, I guess, the complications of rural and remote settings? No, just to reinforce what Lynn said, um, I grew up in a small country town and I really appreciate that there is a finite pool of uh, talent, ability, um, interest um, for that. But one of the marvels of the world in which we now live is we're not constrained uh, by distance in the way in which we were. And here we are all uh, from all over the country, uh, presumably sharing our thoughts and views about this topic that can also be done uh, for an advisory board. So yes, there obviously you want people who are locals who, who understand, uh, but that doesn't mean that, for example, the, the chair of the board needs to be uh, a local. It might be somebody who can just bring uh, this comprehensive framework to it, a, a sense of discipline, but also a care for what the local the locals want um, from, as you said, the standalone facility in, in, a, in a rural or regional area of Australia. So I think we're, we're actually, uh, we're, we're lucky, I suppose, in the sense that by means of modern communication, we've got the ability to go beyond um, the boundaries of a, a small rural area and to be able to bring in people that have got uh, that talent and um, uh, the interest and the ability to contribute um, to, to that facility. Such a key point. If, if yeah. we can have a doctor provide, a, 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 I guess, a, a telehealth solution in a rural setting, then maybe a conversation about the ideas and perspectives shouldn't be limited to, to the backyard, uh, Kevin. Uh, Toby, anything else to add to that in terms of uh, the, the practical application of the advisory board structure? 
and and the tyranny of distance maybe is another theme yeah look i, I like kevin and i spent a long time in uh in rural uh towns and particularly in new zealand and uh, i kind of to be honest I'd rather be in a rural town looking for people in the city uh, some of the time because uh, they, they actually get on and do stuff and they're more pragmatic. Um, that said, I think also reaching out to your colleagues and talking about is there, is there a way of sharing resources so there'll be other people nearby that you know in the sector and there are ways to, I think, uh, be creative about this and it may mean um, saying where you, where you need a technical expert, can that be shared between a few organisations or something to think through and also uh, looking obviously at the technology to do stuff online i think particularly on the consumer side though i try and stick local as far as possible um and try and have local people because that they they live breathe and uh, own that community and so that they'll stand up for it but on the clinical side i realize it's a bit more complex and you may need to get a bit more technical there but i yeah uh, I, I can understand the uh, the issues and good good on you for the work you're doing out in your regional town that's a really important thing yeah i echo that um yeah, congratulations on your efforts, Michelle. Um, uh, I think the message is fr from both the centre and 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 our, our three guest chairs is, you know, reach out, continue the conversation. There may be some some um, middle ground between getting in people who understand the structures and processes and. Uh, ensuring that the, there is a seat for the locally held context. Um, it is a it's it, it's not just one person solution which i think is a is is the another element worth stressing uh, a further question this time for for lynn um lynn what, what learnings have you had in recruiting people for the advisory board for fresh hope care so far and this is from nigel who's who's a member of the advisory board center Who knows the answers, so I'd better be sure I say the right thing. <laughs> um, I, I think um, it's very much that learning journey, um, Nigel. So it wasn't the advisory um, board concept and the process. Um, it wasn't just new for the organisation. It's been new to people that we've approached um, from the point of view of being external advisors for us and subject matter experts like our lawyer and our geriatrician. Um, so it's understanding it's a learning journey. One of the things, and Brendan had it on he, one of his very early slides today, the difference between understanding what a governance board role is versus an advisory board or advisory body role is really important because there are many more people, such as our geriatrician, who's very happy to be on an advisory board or body, but she does not want to run the risk of being seen as a shadow director. Um, so the, the best practice framework that we work through protects our members um, from being their perception or their risk of being a shadow director. So I think that's really important as well for people to be clear on the difference um, and for the process to be adhered to, to ensure we protect all of our members from that risk. I hope that answers your question, Nigel. Yeah, thank you for the question, Nigel. I, I think the uh, the emphasis that we place in the chair program, explaining how to um, avoid and mm -hmm. positive actions to take to ensure that you're creating safety uh, and a feel of confidence to have the more somewhat creative conversations, if I can use that in this context, um, is is really beneficial uh, because as you say Lynn you may well be able to attract potentially better thinkers to offer their to offer their um, their perspective uh, tell me in, if you would like to weigh into that same theme um, and and then we'll get on to Kevin as well yeah I think one of the things I've learned I mean it's, it's interesting the advisory board center is a, is a new concept for a lot of people when you actually look at what it does and go through the training it, it makes total sense. And certainly personally, I've done the AICD course, which I found kind of helpful, but I found the the introduction to this space kind of natural, but also gave me skills in there, which I was already on advisory boards and people hadn't necessarily framed it like that. But most organizations will know or find um, find parts of their organization where they're already doing this kind of work. What the advisory board center does, those give you a framework for that. And I think it's it's important that people have got a clear understanding of framework. And frankly, today, if, like if I was going into aged care, I'd much rather go into an advisory board than onto the corporate board because mm -hmm. the, um, the the risks that go with going on the corporate board, it's a much easier 
ask and um, there's a lot, a lot less time. And there, I think there's a lot of people in the community who've had to give, get, give back, but I'd also be saying to them, if you want to give back, um, you know, prove, prove that by making the effort and actually going through the process and, and study, do some qualification and, and understand how you can actually get professional in this space, I think is really key. Kevin, what's clear is, and this is part of the, I guess, the ongoing professional development is the need to get better together um, from a, from the connectivity with other leaders from the sector. You know, Cynthia Payne comes to mind. Uh, um, what's your view on the need for that? What good looks like on a continual basis and, and the uh, uh, what's working and what's not, uh, if I can pull you in on that sort of practical stuff for a moment? Hmm. Well, um, you know, a bit like Toby, I've, I've served on a lot of advisory boards over the years. Why, why did I look to the advisory board centre? Because it does provide an up-to-date, comprehensive structure about going how we go about these things. Uh, there might be many people out there who are uh, doing a very good job in terms of advisory boards, but this does have a way of ensuring that you've got a peer-reviewed structure in place, that the process is one which has been thoroughly looked at, it's been tested. Uh, you know that it's operating in a whole range of different um, sectors uh, within the community, within the economy. Uh, and so you get that cross learning as well. So people uh, you know, who chair advisory boards might uh, be chairing an advisory board for a commercial organization on one hand and might be chairing an advisory board um, for a not-for-profit uh, at another time and and the ability to be able to learn from different sectors and different approaches is is so important. Toby made mention the Institute of Company Directors course. Uh, those courses have been around for a long, long time and people see the value that comes from it. But in the advisory board world, there wasn't anything up until this was established five years ago to provide that sort of structure, that input uh, in, into the whole process. So I, I think this is invaluable. Um, and, and it is a way forward. And the fact that it's there, uh, I think, is very useful for the aged care sector. Uh, you know, there might have been aged care providers that are already uh, uh, out there doing this. Uh, and it might be that this is, in a sense, being imposed by legislation. But nonetheless, I think it is a way in which all aged care providers can go forward with a degree of confidence. And, and if only from a very pragmatic point of view, having this well structured in place provides a degree of insurance in terms of quality assurance for the organisation. No, it's a good point. And, and I think in terms of the, the practical um... Uh, elements of both our product and our service I wanted to sort of close the loop on on what they look like and and just give um, the guests a, an understanding of of what's involved um, so Lynn members of your uh, executive undertook the technical foundations um, it wasn't necessary for them to do the chair program but an understanding of what good looks like at a foundational level was critical uh, Lynn, you undertook the chair program as as has Toby and Kevin. Um, the ongoing, the the vocational element to the learning, the ongoing, uh, I guess, lessons learned from maybe the hard way, uh, is is why we've got a, a community of best practice specifically for the aged care sector. Looking forward to seeing how things materialise and then shift in terms of the 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 artifacts and tools and frameworks, for instance, um, and just the sharing so that we can be better together in this sector um, and and obviously access, as I alluded to earlier, the, the blue component of my previous slide, access to those who do this as part of what they do professionally is, is the last element. Um, so uh, practical stuff, again, the, the resources, what we've recognised that this is part of what people do and if you're post a corporate um, it's beneficial to have I guess tools and frameworks that you can pick up and apply and this is the same for independent professionals as it would be uh, corporates who are choosing to pick up this IP and apply it so it's all there in word template for you to push fresh hope, fresh hope care at the top of it and uh, and make it useful and bring it to life for, for your organization um, uh, if I may, I, I wanted to um, thank 
you all for being part of um, this conversation. Um, Kevin, where would um, members of uh, those who have joined us for this conversation, where would they find you in terms of your, your commentary on, on the cycling track and or uh, uh, professional pursuits? Um, I'm, I'm going to guess TikTok is probably not on, not high on the list, but uh, <laughs> where are you commentating and providing your thought leadership these days? Um, people can go to my website, which is just Kevin Andrews, .com.au and there are various links from there to various activities which uh, I'm engaged in but can I just make one final point Brendan and that is Please. even though there's a period of time over under which uh, aged care providers have to put this into operation my personal advice would be to start the process now um, that way you'll have time to reflect both on the process, how it works for you in your unique circumstances, about the personnel that you can put in place, and it'll give you time to get it right. I suspect there'll be a lot of people scrambling in the last three months before this needs to be put in place, for whom it'll be much more difficult a process than if you were to start now and have the time to do it in a reflective way. Uh, and and that, that would be my piece of advice to anybody who's uh, engaged in this webinar today. Sound advice. Toby, uh, um, uh, where can we find you these days? It, easiest way to get me is just on LinkedIn. Just look up Toby Hall and um, you'll find me. And I, um, I'm reasonably responsive on LinkedIn. I wouldn't say I'm a, like a 24-hour watcher of LinkedIn, but I do uh, look at it every couple of days. So definitely you'd be able to get a hold of me there. And, and Lynn, what about you? Same for me, LinkedIn is the easiest way to get in contact with me and I do tend to watch it regularly, but much like Toby, not 24-7, so, but regularly. Yeah, okay, understood. Um, so for, for all of the guests that joined us today, uh, I will close the loop, of course, with a brief note to thank you for making the time and with uh, that flyer, the blue and grey flyer that I alluded to earlier, uh, I, I really appreciate you joining us and to our panel. Thank you so much for, for making the time and for, uh, I guess, the depth of response and consideration that you've offered to this conversation. Um, it's pleasing to see the, the uh, opportunities that are emerging um, in this space. So um, thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Bye Thanks, for now. Brendan. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone.